But let's go back to Qatar, and I'm specifically interested in huge amounts of money, possibly hundreds of millions of dollars, in this town, heading into you know towards that building behind you there. How does Cutter, how has Cutter managed to, mm, like you said, sort of play both sides the way that, that you describe? Money talks. I think it's hard to ignore that money. The Qataris have bought the rights to the names of a number of American schools. They created something called Education City in Doha. Um, or right outside of Doha, where they have Texas A&M and Georgetown and Carnegie Mellon, Northwestern. They bought the brands of these universities to create um, satellites. Um, they've sunk huge amounts of money into the university system here in the United States. They bought the World Cup through bribes, according to two British journalists who wrote a fascinating book called The Ugly Game. Uh, where I think they make a very compelling case for Qatari illicit finance purchasing those games. Well, I mean, they, they also, if it, to be fair though, they also make the case, the case that the, the, the authorities, the soccer authorities, actually indicated that it is for sale in the right. first place. That's right. right so but, but this is what I mean though yeah. by, by money talks, right? I mean, the money has um, been sloshing around in world capitals and in the halls of power for quite some time now. Um, there are dozens of lobby firms and white shoe law firms and PR firms that are on retainer here for the Qataris. They sponsor the congressional baseball game every year. They kept the uh, metro open when the capitals were on their Stanley Cup run. The money is enormous. They bought a city block here called City Center, um, high-end retail. I mean, you can't go for more than a few blocks here in this town without seeing some semblance of Qatari influence. I just want to, they sponsor the congressional baseball game. Why it was, I, I, I went for the first time that last year or this year, but I had no idea. Yeah, you'll see, I mean, it's, you That's know. It's astonishing. You know, yeah, and it, it's a regular thing. We see the Qataris, they're sponsoring lots of different things. They've got a lot of money to spend. Um, and they do, and it buys them influence. And, um, They've got a lot of different actors conflicted out. But I think no investment has been more lucrative for the Qataris than the Aludate Air Base, that large air base that we have over there. I mean, they built it to our specifications. Um, it is for us to use in perpetuity. Um, and it gives them security because no one will trifle with them when the U.S. military is stationed there. But as they've built up this sense of security over time, uh, they've also had all of these bad actors based there as well. And again, I do get a sense that this is now all kind of boiling to a head, that Americans are more aware of this as a result of 10-7. Why is the funding of the university so important in your mind? You, you, you focused on that a little bit earlier. We place a lot of value in the top schools that we have in the United States. It's one of the reasons why there was so much outrage, I think, over the way that some of the schools responded to the spike in pro-Hamas sentiment or even anti-Semitic sentiment. Some of the presidents of these schools were brought before Congress to answer to the public. Um, and I think the Qataris seem to understand that, that um, working with these schools, investing in these schools, using the brands of these schools, this buys the Qataris some bona fides. It gives them a certain amount of additional respect. Um, and um, I think it's helped build their brand. I do. Mm. Well, it, you're su suggesting something interesting because, you know, we're talking about this hearing where the presidents of Penn and Harvard and MIT were before Congress and just kind of saying, uh, outrageous, astonishing things, right? Woke, illiter illiberal ideology has infected these schools and these presidents are reflecting that in what they're saying. But you're saying that, that there's also foreign funding possibly uh, influencing their positions. Which I think is problematic at the end of the day. These are American universities that should be serving the American people, raising up a next generation of American students who will one day be American leaders. 
um, it's a problem when you're looking at an authoritarian government of 300,000 people that is answering to no one. Um, their values are not our values. They don't have freedom of religion. They don't have freedom of speech. They are interested in buying power, raw power. And if they're doing that through our universities, I think there is a price that we might pay. There's also this element of buying real estate. You discussed this city block. Again, I wasn't aware of the city block. Um, in this, what, what is the significance of that? Oh, hey, it's just real estate, right? It's gaining a foothold in the city. It's the broader portfolio. Um, you know, they have Harrods department stores in London. They have soccer teams in Europe. We talked about the World Cup. Um, one gets a sense that, you know, when you've got bottomless wealth, you know, of course you're going to spend it. But are you spending it for the exertion of influence? Or are you spending it so that you can make additional money, right? What are the dividends? I think the Qataris are doing it it's twofold, right? They're looking at ways to gain influence in capitals. I think there is a strategic logic to their investment. Um, and, um, you know, I wouldn't have a problem with city center if I didn't see the congressional baseball game and the lobby firms and the white shoe law firms and the PR firms and everything else. I see it as part of a broader strategy, which I'm concerned about because it certainly looks like, at least from my vantage point, that the U.S. government has given up on trying to change the behavior of the Qataris as it relates to sponsoring terrorist groups or even, I mean, we don't even try to hold the Qataris to account. Look at the number of people who died under horrific conditions building the stadiums for the World Cup. They never paid a price for it. I believe we've given the Qataris a sense of impunity. I do know that in Qatar, some of the text, school textbooks, they're rife with anti-Semitic content, very overtly, I mean very blatantly. Yeah. Um, and you can't help but wonder if that somehow doesn't make its way into American, Amer American textbooks. When we look at the Qataris, I'm often asked, um, why are they doing this? What, what, what is motivating this sparsely populated country? Why are they out there supporting Hamas and the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and ISIS and all these other bad actors? Um, they are a Wahhabi country. They, uh, you know, we used to only associate that word with the Saudis. It's interesting, the Saudis have actually undergone a significant process of reform uh, I've been to that country several times over the last several years, and I'm astounded by some of the changes that have happened. It's got a long way to go, um, but it's just interesting because you may recall there was a falling out with um, the other Gulf states and the Qataris back in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, they had essentially come to the conclusion that the Qataris were too radical, even for the Gulf. So we're talking about the Kuwaitis and the Saudis and the Emiratis saying, you know what, we've had our problems in the past, but these guys, this is a bridge too far. Um, and really their, their beef with the Qataris is that they are the probably the number one proponent for the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, now the Muslim Brotherhood for the uninitiated is the cornerstone of every radical Islamist ideology that we've seen come out of the Middle East whether it's Hamas, whether it's Al-Qaeda, ISIS, they're all built from the same sort of core principles embraced by a guy named Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood back in 1928. They today, the Qataris, remain the top proponents of the Brotherhood ideology. And so when you talk about the possible spread of textbooks, it's not just that, it's the sermons at, at mosques, it's at the madrasas, the schools where people are taught, uh, you know, Islamic texts and Islamic teachings. This is, I think, a broader problem. The, the Muslim Brotherhood is one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, grassroots 
uh, religious, political and religious organizations in the Middle East. Mm 